So yeah, we're here to share a resource with you if you are indeed interested to learn more about system change. Um, but first, uh, what is the transformations community? Uh, this is a community, it's a global community of about 1500 uh, scientists, researchers, practitioners. Um, so at the with the focus of transformations towards regeneration and just futures for us all. So thriving and flourishing. Um, so we hold conferences. We've been going for about 10 years doing these conferences. And when we're now uh, breaking out into smaller thematic groups of which systems education is one of them. Um, so what is transformation? Is it different to other forms of change? Um, so yeah, we, we like to look at transformation through the lens of new ways of thinking and being and doing. Um, that's not to say that there's no place for the other types of change, the incremental change, the reform, the policy change, you know, this is all uh, necessary and, and it's not one size fits all. Um, but yes, our, our community are, are the, the leading scientists in the world that are researching this, but they're not just researching, they're also um, embodying and, and doing, and, and so it's the nexus of research and action. So yeah, it's really about um, these new ways of thinking and being and, and doing, and, and, and how do we move from separation to connection? How do we how do we live more regenerative lives? How do we become less transactional and more relational? How do we move from system? How do we move from silos to systems, from competition to collaboration? You know, all, all of this good stuff that I'm sure um, is, is hopefully resonating with you. Um, so what's the first step in systems change, in systems thinking? Well, arguably it could be helping the system see itself. And so mapping the system is, is typically one of the first steps. So um, what we are offering is a catalog of programs that, uh, that are in this space, in this transformational systems education space that help us with these paradigm shifts. Um, so if I can share the screen, let's see if I can do that. I'll just walk you through what the catalog in its first iteration. Can you see this? Yep. Yeah, yeah. cool. OK, perfect. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, this is the, the map. We do actually have a map um, and it's this is our first uh, first stab at it. So we've got about 115 odd courses from around the world. We would like this to be truly global. We know that there's gaps. Um, this is multi-language, but um, yeah, we're aware of the, the current bias towards North America and, uh, and Europe. But um, yeah, so we're here to help co-create this and we'd love your input to see what's, uh, what's where we can plug in some of these gaps here. But let me just show you how this works so it's professional um it's aimed at uh, early career systems change practitioners and um it also degree granting so you can filter on location on format if it's remote if it's uh in person hybrid um how much time you want to spend on it we've got a bunch of languages here um it's a start but it's uh yeah, so we, we do uh, want to be as inclusive as possible. Um, and there's a range, of course, some are free, some are, uh, wow, quite expensive. Um, and obviously that is related to the amount of time that you can commit. So yeah, for each of these courses, um, you can just click in to see who it's for, where it is, some of the core uh the most useful information and then click through to get more details from the the program site so that's that's really it in a nutshell and if you're interested to add your own course because i know that there's a lot of you that have programs um 
I know some of you have programs that we've already mapped in here, but if there's something missing, then we would love you to, uh, to sign up here and that's how you can add um, a course. Um, so yeah, really it's, uh, it's just our, our offering to you. And with that, I'm just wanting to see what resonates, what should be added. Um, that's, that's really it from the mapping perspective. Um, from this catalog perspective, I would just finish by saying, um, if you're interested to help research this emerging field, the field of system change, the field of transformations, um, we are building um, research capacity. We're, we're recruiting both uh, interns and leading practitioners uh, into a community of practice. Um, and we're looking at mapping the challenges, mapping the actors, how do you contextualize system change to your, your local context? Um, so we're building this field. And with that, I shall hand back to Kim. Absolutely. Um, Nick, if uh, you're so inclined, if you want to share the URL of what we're looking at here in the chat session, um, perhaps folks want to bounce out and take a look at it. Thanking you, I did forget to do that. <laughs> and then to the panel at large, as well as our audience. And once again, thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, anyone that would like to get connected subsequently via any of the other social networks, such as LinkedIn, uh, please put your address in the chat session and uh, let's start building a, a deeper community here. Uh, Dr. Fleener, I think you're up if you're ready to go. Okay, awesome. Let me um, set my watch because I want to be very aware of time. I'll keep track for you too. And you'll help me too. Yep. Um, and let me also share my screen. And good morning, everyone, while I'm pulling things up. Hello, hello. Um, this session is actually really exciting to me, uh, given uh, a lot of the research I've been doing. Now, hopefully, are you seeing my screen? We are. There we go. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Jane Fleener from North Carolina State University. And, and this paper is, or this presentation is, is sort of a um, connection with a couple of articles here. And if you want to email me, I'll be glad to, uh, you know, send you these slides. Um, I'm also very big on visual metaphors and, and this leads in nicely from the idea of how do you have transformational change? And, and as Wittgenstein said, you can't really have, you know, a change of aspect until you have a change of language and a change of language requires sort of uh, emerging metaphors. So this, this first slide is, is my, my metaphor for getting on the train and leaving the station of modernism. And so we, we are leaving this station. And what I want to do really briefly is talk a little bit about, you know, some, some ideas about blockchain, um, how blockchain could be disruptive for education to create transformational change. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about a futures mind shift, which is developing understanding for futures literacies, which interestingly, Rail Miller, who is a futures literacy person, is presenting at the same time we are. So, um, uh, so that's kind of sad that, that we're missing that uh, audience. And then the, the third uh, thing I want to do really briefly is talk a little bit about changing metaphors uh, for transformational change. Uh, Jane, um, could it, we ask you to put the presentation in presentation mode so we can see it a bit larger? Sorry. Okay, I thought it was, let me, stop share and then see if I can go back because I was as I was moving through it I thought it was hold on hold on oh sorry we were seeing the the version that's like on PowerPoint still with the slides on the side and all and so it also wasn't probably moving was it or was it you had okay, moved, is that, yeah, is that the was. presentation are we in the presentation yep, perfect okay there you perfect. go there For some reason, when I do two screens, I don't always get what I expect. So sorry about that. No um, worries. If you haven't seen these uh, three reports, the Work Technology 2050 report by the Millennium Project, 
uh, the UNESCO report on reimagining futures and the new social contract for education and the United Nations report on transforming our world. Um, I think those are really key reports to look at and, and I kind of build off of those uh, in this presentation in my sort of vision about what future of work is and how that relates to the future of learning. Um, the future of learning needs for me um, come, I, you know, I'm an educator, I've been an educator, um, K-12, higher education, I now work with adult learners. And one of the uh, shifts, I think, in, in ideas about learning are the need for things, it's called pervasive learning, learning at the speed of need. And one of the challenges with learning now is not so much that we need better formal learning, but we are shifting to more informal and social learning. At the same time, learning theory becomes really important from the perspective of lifelong learning. So it's no longer about learning to get a job. It's learning for life, it's learning throughout life. And those I think go behind um, a lot of what I'm gonna say here about learning shifts. Um, John Seeley Brown is a technology uh, learning theorist who also describes a little bit about how uh, learning is shifting from something that happens individually, you know, sort of the, the person who has all the knowledge who can do really well on Jeopardy to more collective shared values and beliefs, uh, participation in shared learning experiences and activities, uh, very contextually situated learning to create and solve um, real world problems but also supporting uh, play and imagination. Um, the Millennium Project, when looking at the world of work in 2050, I think this is part of the vision of how we think about technology in the future. Uh, work will be more meaningful, uh, more um, social collaboration or social contribution will be more valued, uh, more self-employment, uh, which is, I think is really key. Uh, augmented capabilities and self-actualization. So the world of work is changing as well. So we have a role not only in preparing people for this changing world for work, but in shaping this world of work in the future. So blockchain, I think, becomes a nice disruptor. And you know, when when Nick was talking about um, sort of some of the ways of transforming uh, society, I think one way you do it is to disrupt. And uh, blockchain has a potential to be very disruptive to the educational system. I'm not gonna have time to really go into what blockchain is, but basically it's like a great big ledger system that has distributed users with multiple interlocking uh, copies. And um, we, we most often associate blockchain with cryptocurrencies, which I still don't understand. Uh, but there are a lot of changes and disruptions, for example, in the art world with uh, NFTs in uh, blockchain um, um, resources that are changing how people even think about how you show work, works of art, how you own works of art, what works of art can even be. So, so already we're seeing blockchain disrupt a lot of different areas of society. Um, so go with me on this journey for a second um, and think about lifelong learning and adaptive education as a disruptor to traditional education. So think of, of for example, this um, blockchain here that has um, lifelong learning as a way of demonstrating competency, skills, dispositions, interests, passions, you know, your desires to make a difference in the world in multiple ways. So instead of having to go to this university to get a transcript or to, you know, this provider to go get your uh, CEUs, um, you have a resource or a location where you can share your lifelong experiences that demonstrate your passions, your commitments, your different ways of showing expertise. And those different ways of showing expertise actually allow you to, to be very creative. So for example, let's say you're an influencer, which who knew that was even a thing. And now as an influencer, you want to be able to, you know, work with an organization and say, here's how I can demonstrate, you know, my impact and how my strategies have worked. And, and that becomes part of your lifelong 
learning blockchain profile that you can share with different people. So blockchain as a disruptor has the opportunity and the challenge to formal education systems where education no longer needs to be front loaded. That is everything existing in a formal education setting. It certainly disrupts assessment accountability and credentialing, not only with who owns it, but those are huge businesses. And uh, disrupting the business of accountability, credentialing and assessment is going to be a huge transformation for education. Um, I think you know, this kind of disruption has the potential to level the playing field as well. So for example, you, know, you no longer need to show your academic credentials as I'm from Harvard or I have you know, this outstanding uh, pedigree, academic pedigree, but you can, you can put together your own life learning, learning profile to demonstrate your passions and your abilities and your skills. Um, and so I think this, this as a potential way of disrupting um, can, can honor this holistic uh, approach to thinking about uh, competencies. Um, so I mentioned about metaphors and I think with, from a perspective of metaphors, um, at first, this is a Nautilus by the way, and, and a Nautilus is an interesting um, creature because as, as it grows, it leaves this hard shell behind and, uh, but has this more pliable, emergent, dynamic, interactive, soft shell. And so as, as we look at the metaphors and myths of modernism for power and growth and hierarchies, you know, that is still a part of, of this hard shell past. But um, with, with virtual reality and robotics and pace of change and widening economic and social gaps and global warming, we have these perturbations that I think are pushing us out into this outer shell. And, and that kind of goes to the, um, um, what are those little crabs called that um, they, they, they upshell and, and a lot of animals upshell, that is they outgrow their shell and they go and they find a new shell. Sorry to interrupt Dr. Stay. Fleener, but we're right at 10 minutes. Yes, and, and this is my, yeah. So, so this upshell opportunity is, is an opportunity for changing metaphors and that is actually it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Francisco. Thank you, Kim. You're uh, welcome. Hi everyone. Um, this is um, a very stimulating conversation. What I want to do now is try to um, complement, or in a way, uh, go farther from what both Nick and Janie had presented. Uh, I'm also very inspired by blockchain technologies and transformation. Uh, I would like to present to you a new company that we founded this year, actually. Uh, here in Ecuador, uh, we hope it has a global reach. It's not public yet, so I can share uh, as much as I can, but um, it's this is just a dream that is being uh, coded now. Uh, most of the software that I will show you now, it's already uh, in code, but as I say, we haven't officially yet launched, so it's going to be um, a very beautiful surprise. To, to share this with uh, with you. So, oh, <clears throat> I can't share screen for some reason, <clears throat> but it says I'm a co-host. No, I'm not a co-host. I was a co-host at some point. Did we lose? Hang on a second, let's see what I can do on my side. I think we lost our host. No, I'm here, I'm, I'm okay. just- um, Okay. Okay. And that's here. Um, yeah, perhaps a little bit of a background is that we founded this uh, liberal arts college. This is a, col a micro liberal arts college in Quito, Ecuador. And when the pandemic arrived, um, one second. When the pandemic arrived, um, what we had to do was to 
closed down our physical space and we started to go uh, online and it was very interesting because people from around the country wanted to attend the classes and now because of um because of of zoom and everybody going online we started to have students from all around the country then we started having students from mexico and peru uh, so so the um, the institute started to grow and then i thought can i take this to a digital space and for some very interesting medical reasons, I had to um, get a couple of surgeries where I had to stay in my bed for a couple of months during the pandemic. And then I thought, how can I create that space that I used to have um, on the physical world into a more virtual space? And in the spirit of transformation and collaboration, we designed the new company um, named uh, Freogan, which I want to present to you now. <clears throat> so, um very rapidly uh, the company comes from the old english word uh, friogan which means to free or to liberate it also means uh, to like to love and to honor and free from the germanic and celtic indo-european language means dear or beloved so i thought i could um, put these um these ideas at the core of the principles that we use to design the software. So Freogging is a learning platform that embodies freedom, love and friendship. I think these uh, principles uh, are able to create more cohesion at a level of interaction when coming to a virtual space. Um, and what we're trying to do is to create a software and platform that decentralizes learning and enables humans to cooperate, network, integrate relevant knowledge at large scales around the world. And how, do, how are we gonna do this? Uh, we want to be at the edge of technological design and innovation we believe in pushing the boundaries of what is possible. Um, it's very new. We just have one course that has been imparted currently. Uh, this is our team. Uh, we have a strategic advisor. We have early investors and general managers, uh, global coordinators, designers, fund managers, and the chief technology officer. Um, and well, this is the, the investment structure and people can become investors. So um, to the future of where this wants to be led to is to a cooperative, a large scale cooperative where people uh, can learn and offer their, their knowledge uh, at a global scale. So these, for instance, are not yet um, available. So we can only see this one um, <clears throat> in the learning side. And this is how the learning looks like. So you will have a bunch of different courses. These are courses that are being currently uploaded to the platform. Um, and these are courses that are uh, being imparted at the, at the foundation. So at the liberal arts college here in Ecuador. And now I want to show you how it looks like in the inside. Um, so I need to share again. So the platform looks like this. Um, once you get into the platform, you will be watching something like this. Uh, when you select one of the courses. So similar to what Nick was presenting, you will have some very general information about the objective of the course, who's the course instructor, um, the schedule, then you can also sign in. And then you can apply, right? And you sign in with whatever account, and then you come to the course, right? Um, so things that I would like to present, perhaps the profile where you can have a place where you can have your bio. So you can edit your biography and everybody is able to see, right, what your bi biography is. Um, and you can also show your current projects. You can add different projects that you're working on in the spirit of uh, people being able to read uh, what are you involved in. Usually people have more than one project going on. Maybe you have a couple of companies or you're writing a couple of papers um, and you can present that to people uh, more openly. Then you can also put your information, uh, you know, the company you're working or the NGO you're working or, or the university you're working. Uh, what position do you have, the, the website, your email? So what I'm trying to do really is to make visible um, the information. And then we go to the course. So apart from being, so the learning platform um, allows you to host different courses. You can have the right the meetings on Zoom. 
and that's very clear. Then you have the sessions. I like this part from the sessions uh, because you can have the Zoom recording, you can have the recommended videos and the recommended literature, and you can upload here as many as you, as you like, right? So each little session has its own um, microsystem. And once you complete your recordings and your literature, you can go checking that up and that works for the badges. So we really believe in budget systems and not marrying uh, an eight to one to ten or A B C D or whatever. But it's more about you know how you're completing your sessions, right? You're completing general courses sessions, your code sessions, your videos, your literature, and you will be going, um, you will be adding to the percentage. And once you complete your badge, right? You complete the course, then you get your certificate um, <clears throat> would be available through the platform as well. And you can also have a campfire. Well, we believe in that each one of these microsystems can have its own podcast. So people from their own course can upload podcasts. So trying to equalize the intelligence. So trying to not have these, I'm the teacher, I have the knowledge, you are the students, uh, consume the knowledge. More like we are a community, we can create our own knowledge. We can uh, interview different people from the um, from their own course and and have our own knowledge being created at that uh, point. You can have um, a campfire where you can discuss or ask questions to the community, uh, discuss by topics or by the most relevant information. Um, you can also share different resources, books, white papers, PDFs, articles. Um, and this is something that I really like where we have future, future projects where the, the people that organize the content of the course or the content of the community are able to share um, different projects that they believe in. So for instance, um, right now the feature project we have is the institute that we have here. And if you like, you can connect to us, but you can also, um, see the links and websites of that specific um, institution. And then later on, <clears throat> what I really find interesting, we were talking about blockchain or NFTs is that you can become a co-investor um, or a donator or a, a participant that you say, okay, I like this feature project. I want to invest in it. Um, and later on, <clears throat> we can have, um, blockchain technology inside the all of these um, different transactions to make it more um, horizontal. And finally, you can have a cohort. So you can have a team where you can see a list of people. Um, you can have a to-do if you're doing different um, projects, right, with your team. Let me see if this is going to work. Nope. Sorry about that. Okay. And you can create your own meetups with your teams. Uh, for instance, uh, a list of guests from your own team uh, and at a Zoom location. But, and this is for the course setup. Lastly, I wanna show you this, um, which is the networking space. So for instance, everybody uh, in this conference or in this call can have their profiles and we can easily navigate through uh, who, who is in here, right? I can see your bio uh, and if I like your bio, I can send a message uh, directly from the platform and we can connect through there. Um, <clears throat> and if I really like it, I can uh, see the person's profile. Let me see. Well, you can go directly to the person's profile through here. Um, and you will end up in a view sort of like this one, one second. You'll end up seeing one of these views and you can network and send a message again to that, to that person. Um, so that's the platform we have designed. We hope that we can make a huge cooperative where people can share their, their learning, people can host their learning and uh, we can become co-investors in our projects. I don't see uh, a, a, a new way going to the future. We cannot help each other and see, oh, this is what you're doing. Let me invest in you. 
let me contact you, let me connect with you. Um, but also at the same time, it is a learning platform. So the idea is that we are able to share our knowledge and hopefully uh, anybody can upload the course there and share the knowledge. Uh, there's things that will have to be edited for that in the sense that we need to add feedback loops and we need to add rating systems so that uh, we can create a more um, transparent uh, platform. But the idea is that you can generate your communities um, and then we want to evolve to generate um, more regional, more bioregional communities. And the last thing that I would like to share very rapidly, uh, and this is gonna be very a little bit strange because <clears throat> this is a systems map um, in, the, in the spirit of what Nick was uh, saying at the beginning. This is a theory of transformation <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> with a systems map. This is a, a causal, uh, a cause, cause and effect uh, systems map. And this shows the dynamic of the institutions. Um, this is the dynamic of our own institution. And just to be very clear on this is Friogan, the company, or, or, and this is the purpose. The purpose that we have is in yellow. And the, perp and the purpose that we have, and the way you read these maps uh, is a cause and effect. So we can start in any place and because it's a cause and effect, it will lead to different spaces. So for us, what is very important is to create spaces that develop uh, agency and liberty of the being. Um, we want to create this uh, development to the members of the platform, the people that join the platform. Um, and then what we would like to see is that we create the space, people join the platform, then they start to develop themselves. Uh, and then people start to act on liberty and trust. Then they will start to work on the potential causes um, in their territories. Uh, if people are working in their potential causes and territories, then we will be able to visualize more active local communities. Uh, if active local communities are engaging in collaborative projects based in bioregions, then we will have regenerative projects uh, at larger scale. If we have regenerative projects at larger scale, we will have evidence of um, the benefits of these regenerative projects. And with that evidence, we can get more investments into these um, causes and territories. And with more investments, we will have more resources available to invest in our course, in our causes or territories. And then we can have um, more investment in creating these spaces that act in the spirit of agency and freedom of the being. Um, and all of Francisco, these- Francisco, I hate to interrupt, but we're a little over 10 minutes at this point. <clears throat> okay. So all of that is the, is the purpose that we have. Uh, so it is um, a regenerative purpose that we want to bring alive through the platform. And uh, that will be the end of the presentation. Thank you very right. much. Very good. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Sanjay. Sanjay, are you uh, ready to go? Yeah. Hello to everybody. I'm going to share my screen just a minute. Uh, here we go. Hmm. I need to add, give privacy stingies. I don't know what I need to do here. <laughs> uh, here we go. Did we lose him? Oh my yeah, God, it could be. <laughs> yeah, <It> could be. <laughs> I think we did. He pushed the wrong button. <laughs> you know, my, my quote is that I love the 21st century, but the 24th, this stuff might actually work. Uh, <laughs> Don't right. worry. Uh, 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 sorry, I will introduce. Ah, here hey. it is. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Hello. Precisely. Uh, could you make me a host once again to be able to share my screen? I need to give permission. And it says it quit the app and I had to come back in. I'm so sorry. Uh, can you make me a host once again so I can share my screen? Uh, while we go sharing screen, uh, hello, my name is Sanjay. I am bo in Bogota, Colombia, and I am founder of an organization called Soul Colombia. Uh, SOUL stands for uh, self-organized learning environments. Here we go. Now I can share 
Oh, finally. Thank you. <laughs> this is a bit not so cool. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, can you see my screen? We can. Perfect. So uh, my quick talk is going to be about how we can converse the future of education into happening. And basically, I think we are all thinking about ways of how to change education, but it seems really tough to change education. No, it kind of doesn't move. It's like it's been stuck there. You no, know, the way we learned, well, when I learned, I don't know, 30 years ago, seems to be similar to what my kids are learning now. And so uh, I wanted to say that, like, my mom gave me a poem the other day that I'd written when I was 12 years old. And I can't, I don't like poetry at all. I, I don't remember writing poems, but I do realize that I'd always been concerned about a the inequity that there is in education, that the inequity that there is in the world. I live in Colombia here. Rich people get rich education, poor people get poor education. And it's really tough to figure out how it is that we rebalance this. No, it's like the, the, the system is designed. Capitalism is designed for you to have a moment in which uh, everything happens in which you can't change the system because the ones who have the benefit are always going to be the ones who have the benefit. So. Uh, I've always thought that together we can do much more than the sum of what we would do alone. And that's how we came through to creating Soul Columbia. My colleague Belen is here also on the screen in case you, she, she can answer stuff through the chat. But the purpose of Soul Columbia is to design the future of learning and we do it using self-organized learning environments. Uh, this was invented by an Indian guy called Sugata Mitra. He got a TED prize back in 2013. And a self-organized learning environment is a space, a physical space, uh, like this one that you see in the picture, where you have people, kids, adults, uh, teens, uh, university students, less computers than people, usually one computer every three, four or five persons, and big questions. And we call them big questions because they're tough questions, they're interesting questions, they're something which is in everybody's general interest. So what happens in the process is that people self-organize to find the answers to the questions using their peers and using the internet. There's nobody teaching. So this is like a change in paradigm from the, at least the way I went to school. And then I went, I went to the university and the one I did when I went to my master's and it's instead of telling the learners what they need to know, you ask them if they can find it out on their own. And that's a little bit of what we are trying to do here in Colombia. And our work is in the center of and the intersection of learning but also dialogue and action so i don't know if you all know but in colombia a uh, the government put tons of computers and, and internet in public spaces and public schools public libraries internet public like internet kiosks kind of internet cafes but they're public and in universities and so on and many people don't use and many of these places don't use these computers because people don't know what the internet for, is for so what we do is we scale the sole methodology to these places so we show the person who's in charge of the computer room and the internet and uh, uh, the computer room key how to turn that into a self-organized learning environment having said that uh, we've had teachers using soul, school teachers, university teachers using soul. We've had community leaders using soul. We've had librarians using soul. And for example, this one who's Maria, she, she, she works uh, in a school in Cartagena in Colombia. And she wanted her kids to be good citizens, participant active citizens. And so in her class, she started doing soul sessions to allow them uh, to decide what questions they wanted to ask and how they would solve them. So now she doesn't teach, she doesn't give a class. She just says, okay, what question are we working on today? And then she just leaves and come back, comes back at the end to, to see what answers they've come up with and have a discussion around that. And what's very powerful of this is that these kids started asking all the rest of the teachers of their school that they wanted to learn how they were learning with Maria. <laughs> and so the other teachers went to Maria and said, what, what, what the hell are you doing? And she said, I'm doing souls. And she said, how, they say, how you do that? In any case, the whole school started doing so and all of their both academic results, but like also 21st century skills, all these things which we talk about that education should be doing, these started to happen and this happened in a self-organized emergent manner. So it's very powerful to see that these tools can be used also in other communities. We have this, this kid here who you see on the screen, he's called Robinson. And when we showed him how to do so, he had one of these internet kiosks in a rural area in, in coffee growing country in, in, in Colombia, where he only has good internet, like at seven o'clock at night, 
And so he would bring the community together at 7 p.m. on Fridays to answer questions. And thanks to big questions like, how do I make my crop yield more? How do I make my, uh, uh, how do I have another source of income different than my crops? People started developing projects in bakeries. They started uh, setting up coffee uh, pro projects. They started uh, making bags out of recycled material. And it, so it shows a little bit that these communities with just a simple tool, which is self-organized learning, can really flourish to find their own solutions and livelihoods. So uh, maybe my final example is this indigenous community in the north of Colombia. This guy who you see on the screen giving the thumbs up, his name is Elainer, and he is uh, from the Wayu indigenous community. And his problem was how to help these kids of his community to value their indigenous uh, traditions, their culture, and their identity. And he did it through his soul, inviting them to, uh, asking them what it is that they were interested in. And these, the kids said, no, we like videos, and we like video games, and we like animation. So he said, why don't you learn to make your own? And it turns out to, that to do any of these, you need, well, you need to know how to, you need a story to make a video game. You need a story to make a video. And so they went back to him and said, hey, Liner, yeah, we, well, uh, we did a soul, and it turns out we need to to have a story and so he just threw the question back to them and where do you get stories and so they said ah we talked to the elders of the community and that's how they started uploading onto the internet their stories of their indigenous uh, community just because they had the curiosity and the drive so now what's very interesting is that back in 2020 when the pandemic started this school which is the same one of the kids which you saw in this first picture <laughs> got closed because of pandemia and also rising violence here in Colombia. I, I don't know if you know, but we signed a peace agreement with the FARC guerrilla back in 2016 and things have gotten a little bit worse in these moments. We realized there was a big need for reflection and the need to act to give vo voice to those which were most silenced. Not the ones who suffered the pandemic the most were kids and youth who were locked in their houses for no reason and maybe without the proper tools for it. So we started a great conversation asking what the new school during and after the pandemic should look like. Basically because what had happened in 2020, uh, when we th started to think about it and we started to ask people, we started to ask, sorry, I'll go back here in just a second. We started to ask people of all ages in all sectors, we started to, we talked to students, to teachers, to moms and dads, to principals, to organizations. We started asking, doing soul sessions with that question, how should the new school be? And that's where we got our uh, idea of finding what people thought should be the future of education. And this is the result of that conversation. Uh, I'll put it in the chat briefly. It's in Spanish, but basically, nine big ideas came out of this. The first is that we all need to be talking about education, not only the people who work in education. <laughs> so that's one of the tough things. And with the ideas of these communities, uh, both students, parents, et cetera, et cetera, what we started to see was that maybe two big ideas move how you change the system and the education system. And well, the first idea is that the why of everything is human contact. So everything you do with technology around education around learning has to do with how you enhance possibilities for human contact. And that's one of the important things. So if you're gonna do a video call, and maybe that's a better way of learning because you're meeting somebody than just if you're seeing a video. Or the other big topic which came up was if you change the evaluation system, the assessment system, you can change the system in itself. So with that, some small other ideas came into the education, the idea of what you should do in education, which had to do with letting go of control of the learning, well, returning to the pleasure of learning, um, simplifying education. No, education got a kind of com complicated, so many topics, so many things that you have to know and do. Let's go back to simple stuff, learning to speak, learning to write, learning to read, learning to draw, those kind of things might be more important. And maybe thinking of a new creative explosion in the, in the environments for learning. No, schools have become boring, universities if, have become very standardized. How do you make the, 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 the space where you work, work fine? And finally, the teachers are not the only educators, no? Like any, uh, parents are educators, peers are educators, uh, the TV is an educator, the internet is an educator. So there's educators all over. So 
the schooling systems don't need to just base themselves on who is the instructor and who is the uh, apprentice. And finally, there are many ideas of what we shouldn't do again. And basically, the what we shouldn't do has to do with that as the pandemic is coming to an end, schools are going back to doing the same thing they did in 2019. And universities are going back to doing what they were doing in 2019. So it's kind of like if we hadn't learned much uh, in this process. So having said that, I would like to finish with one idea which we have in this conversation. Sorry, my timer is kind of making a big noise. When we came back to our end of this conversation, we said, okay, so now what? We had a conversation with over 300 people from all places all around the country and a conversation uh, which took us to the point of, okay, what shall we do now? And maybe what we will do is start from understanding that everything is based on the assessment system. And if you change that, you can change everything. And how could that be? Well, our invitation is to invite people to converse about what if we changed our, uh, our exam-based system from asking questions to students to which they should know the answer for questions which do not have an answer. So I'll give you an example. What if your exam in, I don't know, ninth grade is, is there liquid water on Mars? No, nobody knows if there is liquid water on Mars. No, we, we don't have the answer to that. What if we just allowed uh, students, learners to come together using the internet and using their peers to research what they can find out about that and have discussion. And what you're assessing is not if they know the right answers, but if how they're able to collaborate, communicate, be creative, how, what, what, how their critical thinking is going, how they're able to self-direct their learning. And that could really change to get, take us to a change in the education system as a whole. So that's our invitation from Seoul, Colombia. Thanks for being part of this. It's been an honor to be with you today. Thanks. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you very much. Um, watching the clock here. So uh, my presentation, I'm going to abbreviate a little slightly. I uh, will put in the chat session here in a minute uh, where I will post this on my website and LinkedIn, the more complete version. I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. But I have to tell you that I'm very pleased to see as many people that are involved and really concerned about how do we re-engineer education so that it becomes a lot more engaging, a lot more collaborative, and a lot more effective. And quite honestly, one of the things that I have constantly been preaching is that it's important that we reinstitute a feeling and a love of learning throughout the entire process. We've got to realize that learning is really the only thing, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> that matters. Uh, let me set my timer here. And uh, can you see my screen, I hope? Yes. Yes, OK. All right, so when people say that AI, augmented adaptive learning technology changes everything, I simply re respond with, that's, that's quite an understatement. But before we can really understand what AI does to an educational model, we need to understand the failings, at least from my perspective and many others, of what the existing system uh, is uh, lacking. Uh, we have a one teacher to many students model. And this model is close to 150 years old. It is not the way we've always taught each other, uh, but it's a relatively new innovation that was uh, forced by the uh, innovations that were beginning to occur at the beginning of the industrial age. Now, keep in mind, 150 years ago, there was no distribution of electricity and actually very few people even had indoor plumbing at that time. So it was one sage on the stage in front of numerous children. Now, I did a quick analysis and uh, throughout the world, those numerous children counts can be as high as 50 or as low as 12 to 13, an average about 30 students per human teacher. That's a lot, we all know that's a lot. The learner's progress is measured by grades and I have yet to have anyone tell me uh, seriously what a grade actually measured. I uh, had a conversation with someone in the training industry and their question was, do we really want a um, C student piloting an aircraft? The answer is no. 
So we all know that grading is fictional to begin with, and many institutions either shift that curve at the bottom of the screen to the right or to the left, and that even further invalidates what a grade uh, constitutes. The other issue with grades is that you're telling a student that they're a failure. And I've never met a student in my life that's a failure. I've always met the system that has failed the student. You also have to operate within a predefined timeline. And the assumption there is that we all learn at the same pace, that we all learn the information in the same sequential manner, and that we all at the end of the class should be at the same level. There's some fallacies there that we've been wrestling with once again for 150 years that it's just time for us to take a look at and seriously deal with. And to repeat myself, it's a 150 year old mass production model. The idea was you crammed 30, 40 students into a classroom and you graduated them at the back end. And then they were all quite capable of working at the local factory. That was then, this is now. The first generation of adaptive learning technology tried to rectify some of those issues uh, by allowing students to basically pretest, or there were other assessment mechanisms that we used in order to ascertain the level of that individual student and where they actually belonged in the educational cycle. Some students could flash forward to chapter four, other students had to plod through chapter after chapter after chapter, and other students could just kind of hop skip as they were required. The issue though, is that it was still tied to rigid timelines. Uh, whether it was eight, 10, 16 week programs, uh, if a student knew all the material, they got to sit there. And a student that was being left behind remained left behind. And the system was still uh, measured by something called grades. And at the end of the day, it was still a one teacher to many students model. Actually, what we're beginning to see, and this is, uh, I'm very, argue, I argue against this greatly, is that some school institutions are trying to a, include AI in the classroom as a teacher supplement. And that's not what this system does. Artificial intelligence, when you augment adaptive learning technology, begins to look more like a mind map as opposed to a sequential series of content that's being distributed across X amount of time. There's a lot of independent research. There are mastery objectives that that learner needs to achieve. There are collaborative study opportunities. And then there's also a de in which the student can begin to explore how the particular topic that they're investigating is actually connected to the world at large. Uh, no surprise there. There are no predefined contents. There is no timelines and there's no grades in such a system. So how in the world can this work? Artificial intelligence, ALT, is designed to support the learner's natural curiosity. What we're after is learner success. So my quote is, if it takes student A six weeks to learn algebra one and student B three weeks and student C 12 weeks, who cares? At the end of the day, what we want is that student to learn the topic. We don't want to put them in a position that they feel that they're superior or a failure. We just want them to learn. So mastery is a very important component to this. It's a very personalized environment. The student's supported by multiple teachers. The student is supported by a dedicated AI that is only concerned with that learner's success. It upends, it turns the traditional system upside down in which it is no longer one teacher to many students, it is one learner to many teachers, including the AI teacher. Now, what we've discovered is that that model in the center is not adequate enough. You need to supply, uh, support that learner with a variety of other mechanisms and for the sake of time, I'm not going to elaborate on each and every one of these boxes as I intended to, but uh, I'll quickly pace through them. The learner is always centric to the system, always. The human educators is, are now concerned about inspiration, enthusiasm, excitement, insights, uh, 
instilling that love of learning in the learner as opposed to standing on the stage and reciting, regurgitating information. And the AI is focused specifically on that learner. The Mastery Engine is a central repository of peer-reviewed materials that the learner is attempting to master. There are subject matter experts available to the student at all times uh, in the system. There are a number of outside in interfaces that are available so that we know where that student is within the context of their educational cycle. There is no such thing as eighth grade math, by the way. There is only math. And if you're four years old and you can master it, who cares? If you're 18 years old and you finally master it, who cares? What we want is mastery. An empathy model teaching students that care and compassion are a component of education, always have been, always will be a collaboration universe where the students can participate with others around the world and a socialization component that is composed of critical thinking, algorithm, literacy, media, media literacy, et cetera. So at the end of the day, a re-engineer educational model is focused specifically on the student and allows the teacher to finally do what they do best, encourage, enthuse, excite, inspire. It's time to educate as if it's the 21st century instead of pretending that we can fix the 19th century model. I have contact information here. I will share it uh, in the chat session, but for the sake of expediting our conversation, I think the most important part of our day today is, uh, bear with me, I need to push more buttons. You know, you, the beauty of the 21st century is you can have 10,000 windows open at the same time. All right, did I kill this share? I just did, yay. <laughs> Good grief. You know, my quote is, a, the, the beauty of the 21st century is, is, it's really cool, but in the 24th century, this stuff might actually begin to work. Uh, all right, there were a couple of, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, some standards are in order here, don't you think? Uh, I always tell people we'll never get to Mars under these conditions. Um, so I'm going to open it up uh, generally to our panel first. If you've got any uh, I items that you'd like to kick off with the presentation in terms of getting a, a facil facilitating uh, a question and answer session, and I think uh, I don't know where our um, um, yeah, go ahead, sir. So uh, maybe I'd love to start, Kim, and and say to 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 Jane, to Francisco, to Nick, um, that it's it's quite impressive how I think we're all thinking what it is we need to do and how we can leverage technology to help us do it. No, but there's always this issue of there's things which are happening right now which are really tough to change. No, <laughs> it's like yeah. we have like mental models and habits of doing stuff which 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 are really tough to change no? if we learned in the previous in the schooling system you were explaining kim and how do we get our kids not to have to do the same thing we did because that's the way we know how to do it no and i think one, one of the big issues in in education has to do and and as we're talking about reimagining education and 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 not like universities and what universities have to do well there's a big thing in being able to change the standards no? and being able to to let go of the learning process and stop thinking that we that we know what people need to know <laughs> right and and what i see in all of your in, in all of your presentations which I, which i think is very interesting is the fact that we're trying to create a uh, ways of reaching a uh, uh, people with what they're interested in getting to know and also with what possibilities they have to learn uh, which are outside of the schooling system the, no, the conventional schooling system and at the same time we're trying to do that but being able to be safe in the schooling system so that they can get a job <laughs> and like the concern is always okay this is enough for them to be able to learn stuff and all that but the big dilemma is how the job world works a little also and how you get a job and how you get paid for what you do and i think that's where it, it's interesting to understand that the conversation that we, we started here in columbia but i now want to invite everybody to to continue having is how, how do we change that that just sort of assessment system how we say that somebody knows what they know and how we say that somebody's good at what they 
do and and how do we know what people should start being good at and i think of stuff like i would be i would love to receive one of francisco's badges saying sanjay is good at loving and and he should get paid for being good at loving you <laughs> know